All right, we're, I think we're good to start. No one's giving me a thumbs up, so. Thank you guys, cool, <laughs> perfect. Um, I'm Emma Balder, thank you guys so much for coming, um, for having me, thank you Daniel Ma for inviting me, for organizing all of this and all your hard work um, and the college for having me here. Um, so for this talk, I am gonna give you a little background about me and my work uh, and how I got to my current work and then I'll talk a little bit about the work in the show um, and how curiosity and experimentation and motion have been uh, crucial parts of my practice. Um, and then I will show you guys a couple of things that I'm working on now. And then I'll take any questions you guys have at the end. Um, so, clicker here. My story begins in Boston, Massachusetts, uh, where I was born and raised. Uh, I grew up kind of in an indirectly creative family. My mother was always kind of sewing growing up. She was sewing us costumes, like this crazy one that I am wearing as a kid. Um, and that was really her creative outlet. Um, she would sew costumes, stuffed animals, um, and then later worked in art museums. And my father was an optician, and so he owned an optical store. And I was kind of his right-hand daughter at trade shows and would help him pick out eyeglasses and things. And um, so I grew up with kind of this understanding of the importance of both a creative outlet and making things, but also with this value of, of seeing and observing. So as a kid, I was always quite creative. Um, musically, you know, I played a variety of instruments, uh, was singing, did theater, um, was always crafting, like carving pumpkins and drawing and painting. And I really uh, developed an interest in textiles. Um, at a pretty young age, I would collect textiles, um, I would cut up my own clothing and try to make my own out of it. Um, and in high school, I ended up taking a fashion design course at the School of Fashion Design where I learned about clothing construction, there we go. Um, so along this interest, I had taken other art classes, I took a painting course at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston um, where I fell in love with painting. So I ended up going to the Savannah College of Art and Design uh, for, and got my degree in painting. And I chose this degree over fashion because I really enjoyed the flexibility of painting. You know, I learned that painting didn't have to be restricted to just paint on canvas. Um, it could be non-traditional. And so I spent a lot of time learning technique there. Um, this is a uh, piece of work that I did in undergrad. Um, a, I did a series of juicy juice paintings, juicy juice boxes in random places. Um, but I also was experimenting a lot, um, you know, making abstract work, some conceptual work. Um, these were a series of curse word paintings that I did. Um, and I will not say what they are, but you can maybe figure them out. They're stretched curse words. And I also made these little bubble gum paintings. These are some of my favorite paintings from college um, where I essentially made a form uh, out of high density foam and then went to the industrial design building and took, uh, did a vacuum form over the form. So um, essentially melted plastic um, to create this kind of bubble-like form, and then chewed way too much bubble gum and <laughs> stretched it over the form, and then did the vacuum form over it to kind of seal the bubble gum in. I got really sick from that project, <laughs> from chewing so much bubble gum, but it was a, it was a fun project. But so I was uh, veer, really veering away from traditional paint here. But my interest really lay in abstraction. 
So, and this is where I continued my journey after college. So I was really pulling from the landscape, this piece I made uh, when I was in the south of France painting directly from the landscape. And I had begun this blind contour process, um, drawing the landscape and not looking at my paper, but just looking at the landscape to really develop this, um, this closer connection with the landscape. And I still use that practice in my work very, very much so now. Um, and the inspiration has not changed. This is another piece I did. Uh, and so after college, I ended up doing a month-long residency at the Vermont Studio Center, uh, and then was awarded a year-long residency fellowship there as part of their staff artist program. So I was there for a year. I had a studio, and we would have 60 artists and writers come in from all over the world to do residencies. And it was during this year that my practice really transformed and I had this freedom to experiment with my work, to, to play in my practice, and, um, and I really started to develop my own style and my own voice. And I could be surrounded by my peers and, and be influenced by them. So, oops, there we go. So this is a piece that I was working on, um, and I had cut up, um, I had cut out this form out of this large abstract painting that I was working on. And at the time, so we would have 60 artists come in from all over the world to do residencies, and I started noticing a lot of the waste that they were creating. And it both really bothered me and I saw beauty in it. And so I wanted to incorporate some of that into my work. So, you know, the waste ranged from pieces of paintings, um, you know, lots of paint tubes, full sheets of watercolor paper, and a lot of textiles. Textiles, excuse me. So I was working on this painting and I ended up cutting up this painting and rearranging the pieces and creating these nine smaller paintings that I call pinglets, which is like a painting lit, and coming from the idea that, you know, I'd created this mother painting and then kind of birthed these smaller paintings. And so I'm playing around, you can see the, the pink and purple stripe there, that's fabric, and this is all sewn together by hand. And so I really had started to break up the canvas and break up the frame of the painting. And it really marked this um, exploration in my practice and this experimentation as well. And the, and the importance of that to me. And I really started to explore the possibilities of what painting could be and what it could mean to me. So I started playing around with the fabric remnants, with fringe, thread. Um, this, all of this fringe came from one of my mother's old opera coats and each individual piece of fringe is, fringe is hand sewn on there. And this work I created over my year there at Vermont Studio Center um, using different embroidery. You can see the green kind of mountainous like piece at the top. Ooh, there's a, uh, up there, there we go. Using the laser, it's great. Um, that piece up there, that was actually part of those uh, pinglet paintings that we had seen earlier. This was an installation that I also did at my time there, and you can see some of the pinglets in the background there. So I was really experimenting, playing around with these materials, seeing what I could do with them. 
This one is uh, these acrylic paintings uh, on paper that I had cut out with an X-Acto knife. Um, you can see kind of in here and in here, very detailed. This is a really small piece. It's about four, five inches, or I'm sorry, that's not five inches. It's about 10 inches. Um, and then this was all sewn in to fabric. And I was also sewing into wood panel, which was very difficult. <laughs> and sewing into paper as well. This one's called Space Jellyfish, because to me it looks like a jellyfish. And I was painting on fabric and then sewing that fabric into the paper. And this is all thread here as well. And it's actually threaded uh, the thread kind of wraps around the paper. So kind of playing with the frame of the paper and trying to go beyond that there. And as I was continuing to play with these remnants on paper, um, I explored this fiber painting process. So this piece is called Softcore Spacecraft and this is the first fiber painting that I did, the first of its kind. Um, I was gluing things down, I was using a brush and medium to paint with the fibers, and this work really catapulted me into this journey of fiber painting. And I spent five or six years um, diving headfirst into this practice that I had developed where I am essentially uh, manipulating fibers so that the threads, the smallest bits of textile waste, these little puffs and pulls that you come from your shirt and your sweater, um, this waste that I had collected from makers and artists and designers from this residency and continued to um, collect from artists and designers all over the world and so I was manipulating them with a paintbrush and sometimes tweezers and matte medium and very carefully pushing and pulling them on the paper or the substrate and painting with the fibers. And then I go in with uh, graphite as well. You can kind of see some little dots and small marks in here and in here and I will respond to the fibers uh, with the graphite, uh, responding to their contours, and sometimes go in with acrylic paint and um, really uh, accentuate the colors of the fibers. So in the pinglets, so here are some of the scraps that I'm using, this is kind of my Mary Poppins jar of scraps that just kind of keeps going and going and going. Uh, and this is a little uh, fiber painting to go kit that I made for myself. So you can kind of see this is just a little bundle of fibers and then I've got a mini paintbrush that I had to cut to fit inside this jar. And oh, the laser is not wanting to work anymore. Oh, oh there we go and then the um, tweezers, and then I got some water here in my map medium, and so I would take this on my travels so I could um, do fiber, make fiber paintings anywhere. And so this, this process is really um, very different but complementary to the pinglet paintings that you saw earlier. Um, so in the pinglets, you know, I'm really using paintings like fabric um, sewing into them with needle and thread. And then with these works, I'm starting to use fibers like paint. So this is, I put in some little short time lapses so you can get a sense of the process. Um, apologies for the poor quality, but in these, 
I arrange the composition on my table with the loose fibers, and then I very carefully kind of bring them over to the substrate and then tweak the composition to my liking. And part of the beauty in that is that it changes. The composi composition is always changing um, in that process and in the painting process as well. Whoops. And so this one, so you kind of get a sense of how I'm doing this. Um, you can see I'm, and I'm sorry, I don't have an actual video of this, but I am using the paintbrush to kind of push and pull those fibers. Um, and the composition changes a little bit and it flat, obviously flattens the fibers as well. And then here I am going into the fibers with the graphite. And I, with these ones, uh, with the more detailed ones, I am using a 0.3 millimeter pencil to kind of get into those teeny tiny microscopic little bits. And then this one, I am going into the paint. And I'm just using acrylic paint. I'm sometimes treating it like watercolor. So kind of watering it down a little bit. But I'm not dipping the fibers in paint. There's no dipping. It's, the fibers are already colored, as you could see. And so I was really in this process of exploring fiber painting, I was really kind of learning this new technique that I had developed. And in a sense, I was relearning how to paint. So I was playing around with diversifying my marks, using more paint, less paint, um, leaving areas with just pencil, making heavier marks with pencil and lighter marks with the pencil and leaving some of the fibers a little bit more feathered and some areas more dense as well. But still trying to keep experimentation present in my practice. This piece is called Acorn Temple and like Space Jellyfish, which we had seen earlier, I've painted into fabric and then this is all sewn into paper and this as well. Uh, this is not the best image of this work, but um, these, I did a series of paintings in Western Colorado where I reversed my process. So instead of going in with the fibers first and then graphite and paint, I did paint first and graphite and then went in with the fibers afterwards. And so something that's really interesting in these works is there's this element of pareidolia. And I know I had talked briefly with a couple of you earlier about this, um, but pareidolia is seeing something recognizable in something that's abstract. So like seeing a face in the clouds or like a Rorschach test. And so I often see an image in the works while I'm making them and then kind of lean into that image and accentuate the forms and the shapes of the image that I see within them. This one's called She of Life. Um, this one's on an upcycled ottoman cover that I found. And so the, these, this work and the next work are part of a series I did called the Theatrics of It All series. And it was a series of creatures um, working with this idea of pareidolia. 
Um, so these creatures, creatures began appearing in my work more and more. And I kind of started to roll with that. So I was thinking about these, these creatures, these clusters of creatures um, being like communities banded together. So this, this one I was thinking about people gathering around a fire, um, both taking from the fire and feeding the fire as well. I think this is probably the most creature-like creature here. And in that as well, they were also, the, the, the fibers are also beginning to develop a narrative also. And this piece is called Escapism, as is a diptych. And this one and this next one are, were really inspired by these supernumerary rainbows that I was seeing in Colorado. Um, and they were also kind of marking my transition of jumping back and forth between Denver and um, Houston, Texas. But I was really interested in these supernumerary rainbows where um, it almost looks like they're so beautiful. It looks like rainbows kind of stacked on top of each other. So as opposed to a double, ra double rainbow, which is also kind of stacked, but you can see the full rainbow, uh, each full rainbow. This was, it, it looked like rainbows that were kind of lined up against each other and receding in space. It was absolutely magnificent. And so I had been making pinglets or these sculptural paintings um, here and there, but I really began coming back to this work um, fully uh, in 2019 and devoting more time to this part of my practice and really showing it more. So I'm essentially, with this work, I'm, I'm creating a large abstract painting um, on rectangular canvas. inspired by the landscape. And then at the point of satisfaction, I cut it up and then I rearrange the pieces and I sew them together and simultaneously sewing in textiles. So you can kind of see like in here and in there, that's a piece of an old sweater and some embroidery in here too. And I've been incorporating more soft materials like rope, um, paracord, larger swaths of fabric, and beginning to stuff the works as well um, to give them more of a body and a presence. Uh, so this work I um, actually did for Sweet Green in Denver um, at the Wawada Station at the Wada location, excuse me. Um, so giving you a sense of scale. So in dedicating more time to both of these processes, I began to realize that the fiber paintings and the pinglets really need to coexist and that they're complementary to each other. Um, I see these, the fiber paintings as microcosms of the pinglets, of these sculptural paintings. So if you think about the material, these fibers are the teensiest parts of some of these larger paintings, um, and they, they originate from them. So some of those creatures and these kind of vortex-like, portal-like works kind of pull you into these larger sculptural painted wor worlds. So in this work, I was playing with scale, playing with the substrate, um, playing around with how to, how to configure the canvas and the textiles in new ways. 
So I was using larger pieces of fabric remnants, um, stuffing them, twisting them, using pieces from my own life. Uh, there's some pieces of my late dog's studio bed in there. Um, adding a little more embroidery here. And at this time I had begun creating um, a backing for these quilted paintings. Here's another image to give you a sense of scale of this piece. Um, so I had created, been, begun creating these backings for these quilted paintings. So um, kind of treating them like a pillow and then stuffing them with recycled foam and fiber fill and other scraps. And then I go in with um, a six inch needle to sew into the stuffed works. And that's kind of the last step. And when I'm doing that, I'm creating these, I'm kind of sculpting in the work more. So I'm creating these peaks and valleys within the work and creating more of a sculptural quality. So you can kind of see that in this piece, um, how it gets a little bit more sculpted in here. So here at the college, um, I have a collection of works from the past few years, which really explore movement in different forms. So wind, clouds, um, natural cycles, water, and they're all very experimental works using different techniques and approaches. And experimentation and play, I think as you've seen, is very crucial to my practice and to life because, you know, curiosity, with curiosity comes change, comes movement, um, and with that comes, comes growth. And so I really wanted to highlight that in this show. So these works are um, inspired by the clouds. Uh, my, and an, an airplane is my favorite place to sketch, uh, not only because of the aerial view of the landscape, but also because I love to sketch the clouds. And at this time, at the time of making these two works, I was sketching the clouds often, both in and out of airplanes, and thinking about their constant movement and change and how their, their form and their shape never stays the same. And so I was thinking how I could capture something statically that is in constant motion. So considering the shapes of the clouds that would, that would remain in my mind. And also what the idea of constant motion leaves you with, you know, it left me with this awareness of this life fact that, you know, things are constantly changing and I have to change as well. Um, so this is the Cycle of Uncertainty series and this is a pandemic series uh, that is capturing the Cycle of Uncertainty and different emotions that we kind of went through during the pandemic. Um, but also, you know, I think a cycle of life, not just pandemic specific. So going through those motions and emotions and understanding that we wouldn't remain stagnant in one emotion, that the cycle would, would keep going and keep moving. So each work really touches on an area of that cycle. So. Um, and, the, and the titles demonstrate that. So, you know, we question, we absorb, we escape, we're fearful, we're at peace. Um, you know, things get better, things get worse. And these were, I had worked in series before, but I had always broken up the series. So these works, um, I have been adamant, adamant about them staying within the series. I wanted these creatures to really remain uh, together. So this work uh, is called Earth Untangled. 
And I made this work when I was living in Paonia in Western Colorado in the high desert. And I was working on, I was helping to build this straw bale home using local materials. And I really got to witness the water crisis, the drought uh, firsthand. Um, so I was in this agricultural community and you know, where there's farms everywhere, um, everyone grows their own food, and these farms had run out of water to um, nourish their, their, their farms and their animals. And so when I was building this home, I, we were rinsing the impurities out of the sand to make this plaster to add to the outer, the exterior layer of the home. And um, yeah, so we were rinsing this, this sand and wasting all of this water. So I started recycling the water and putting it in like hundreds of buckets, any bucket that I could find. Um, and then we ended up filling several um, tanks of water and giving it to local farms and businesses. So while this work is obviously about water, um, you know, it kind of resembles a wave. Um, I think of it as like a wave-like creature. Um, it's also learning about taking initiative and taking action when an opportunity or an issue presents itself, um, especially when it comes to helping others in need. And so this work also uh, coincidentally coincided with my partnership with PepsiCo's Life Water uh, for their Art of Recycling series. And this launched in the beginning of 2020 with the company's switch to 100% recycled plastic packaging, which is a very small um, but big step for such a large company. And this was the section that we used here. So this piece, Interference with Fate, uh, came about um, as I was taking a hike through the woods by myself and I was at about mile six and I stopped to take a break and to drink some water and I sat down at this, uh, on this tree trunk. There was kind of two trees, trunks that were merged together and it created this perfect little seat. And I sat down and there was this little frog that was stuck in a hole. And he was wiggling about and his, his two front, his two arms were, were kind of trying, reaching out, trying to get out. and. And I, of course, tried to help it. I tried to wedge my finger in between the frog and the edge of the hole, and that wouldn't work. And then I foolishly grabbed a stick, thinking, you know, maybe it will grab on, and I cheered him on, and of course that didn't work. And, but so I was really thinking about um, this interference of fate. When, if at all, do we interfere with fate, or do we let nature take its course? So thinking really about life and death and the cycle of life and, uh, you know, sometimes life throws us a wrench and we have to find a way to keep moving and try to not get stuck. And with this work, I was also playing around with these holes. Um, in here, so leaving, oftentimes there will be these holes in my work um, and I will actually cover them. But here I was playing around with leaving them uncovered, which was uh, enjoyable but very difficult because the construction of fabric gets a little complicated and finicky. And I was also experimenting here with stuffing the textiles. 
Um, so not letting the canvas, um, so the painted canvas, take on all the sculptural effort. Um, and so these works, uh, these wind drawing works, I wanted to save these for last because um, they most directly deal with physical movement and because it's very windy here. Um, so in addition to these blind contour airplane sketches, I also had started making these turbulent sketches where I would, um, in an airplane, or on a bus or a train, I would let uh, the, my pencil, let the turbulence move my pencil on, in my sketchbook and just kind of letting it freely move. And so um, from that idea came the idea to use the wind. So I started making these wind sketches in my sketchbook where I'd let the wind blow the paper onto my pencil and eventually moved to these larger pieces of paper. So I went up to the rooftop of my studio and took these giant pieces of paper on a very windy day and let the wind blow the paper onto me as I'm very quickly moving my hand with the pencil and kind of responding to the wind, but also letting the wind blanket me. And then I took those drawings. I, I had no intention of doing this. Um, this was kind of just a way to loosen my hand, um, especially after working so tightly with the fibers. So I had no intention of including fibers in them. They were just kind of a, um, it was just kind of play for me. And so, but I did, I ended up taking them back to the studio and um, incorporating in the fiber painting with them. So uh, I brought in the fibers and then added in the graphite and the paint, like I had explained earlier. And this really ended up being a way for me to really loosen up my marks um, and be less precious with the fibers and the fiber painting works. Um, and so I also wanted to show you kind of what's going on now in the studio. Uh, this is a work that I recently completed this year um, and taking a more sculptural, sculptural approach um, and literally coming off the wall uh, making this in the round sculpture and really playing with the structural capacity of the work and of the textiles, stuffing into the textiles again, playing with my uh, marks with the embroidery. That's all embroidered right there. And letting things kind of loosely hang. And this, I wanted to show you one of these works before it gets cut up. So this is a piece that has now been cut up, but this was right before. Um, and I just wanted to show you what the sculptural paintings look like before that happens. And then this is a mock-up. Um, this is an installation that is in progress. Um, that has come from three different paintings that are about the size of, of this one. So there's three different ones. Not the same painting, a different one. Um, and this is a grant-funded project um, from a grant from the city of Houston that is going to be shown in June. Um, and I invited the Houston community to bring in a meaningful textile from their home and um, share their stories about this textile and then cut it up and sew it into the work. So you can see this is very much in progress now, but uh, you can see some of the textiles in here hanging and over here. And this will actually, this work will actually hang from the ceiling, so you'll be able to walk under it and um, it will be kind of immersive. 
And that's, that's it. Um, so stay tuned for more info on that, but um, that is all I've got for you. Uh, I'll take any questions if you guys have any. What was my biggest influence on using fibers? Yeah, so, um, you know, textiles were, I was always really interested in textiles as a kid, and um, I think seeing my mom growing up and seeing my mom sewing all these things, um, that was a huge influence to me um, that I didn't realize until later, much later on. Um, yeah. Anybody else? Yeah. How do you attach the threads to the what the flat ones that are the paper? How do you attach the thread to the paper? Is it all sewn? So that's not sewn. So those are attached using the the medium, the painter's medium. So that medium acts as an adhesive. Um, but it's a little bit different from glue and then it has a little bit more viscosity. So it's like a little, it's a little thicker. Um, and it allows me to kind of move the fibers uh, with more ease. And um, it, yeah, that's acting as an adhesive to the paper or the panel. Um, and then after I go in with the graphite and the paint, um, then I seal everything in with a fixative. Anybody else? It seems like you have a couple of different, well, a number of different processes for how you kind of start an approach to work. But do you always start with like a, a drawing or a specific idea, or do you like let, let the, the materials kind of dictate how the piece comes together? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I really let the materials dictate the work. Um, I think typically I'm not sketching before I make a piece um, and I go in with no knowledge of what it's going to look like. It's all very intuitive. Um, I think the wind drawings were the only ones where I really had done some preliminary sketch work um, beforehand, but that was very unintentional. Was I ever discouraged by the way I experimented? Um, like personally or, or externally? Yeah, um, I didn't understand why I was experimenting for a while. Um, but I knew, I think that there was some part of me that knew that I had to keep going. Um, and I think when you play around like that, you know, I knew that there was, I knew that there was some connecting thread, no pun intended, between all of my works. Um, and I just, I didn't quite see it yet. Um, and I, there's, there are still some connecting threads in there that I don't, that I don't see. Um, so yeah, I mean, I have definitely felt discouraged. Um, yeah. 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 That's. That's a great question. Um, a couple of things. One is a step away. That is so important. I have, a, I have a sign in my studio that I made that just says step back. And it's always there. So I always have that reminder that if I'm stuck, 
the best thing to do is not to overwork it, is to step away, either work on something else or go, you know, to the park or, you know, to the museum or something. Go do something totally different and come back to it with, with fresh eyes. Um, and then the other thing I'll do, um, so, so that I'll do with a specific work, um, if I'm struggling or I'm stuck on a specific work. Um, but in general, if I have, um, if I'm struggling to kind of make something new or, um, you know, there's kind of a little bit of a stagnancy um, in my practice, I will just sketch. I'll just go to the park, sketch the clouds, um, do a lot of those blind contour sketches, um, and just do them one after another. Not even look at them in my sketchbook, just sketch, next, sketch, next. Um, and that's super helpful, too. It's really my way to get it out. Um, you know, I think with the wind drawings, that was kind of blowing up my sketch. Um, but the sketchbooks, to me, you know, they're like journals. So they're really kind of kept for my own research. Um, and sometimes I'll refer back to them, but I won't necessarily physically use that, the sketch, if that makes sense. Yeah, um, so I think it, our making is a practice. It is an everyday practice. Whether or not you're physically making something is, can be irrelevant. You know, I think that, um, you know, you can be sketching, you can be writing, um, and I think that that's all part of the work. You can just be observing, and that's part of the work. Um, but I think as a practice, and as a practice that you're gonna revisit over and over and over again, and you can always come back to, um, it's, it's, you, you, you've got to keep, keep practicing. It's like music, right? You know, you only get better and you only start to develop your own style and your own voice when you keep going. And eventually things will start to unfold and you'll see things a little more clearly. But it takes dedication and showing up every day um, to, for that style to reveal itself, I think. Um, there was another part to your question that I'm not sure I answered. Just kind of uh, speaking to like the body of work, like, and again, I, I don't know if it's fair for me to ask you like number of pieces or percentage of pieces, but like all of the things that you create that, that inform the, you know, your work or whatever you want to call it, like what, like what the, again, not fair to ask this, but number of pieces or percentage of work are you really excited to see? Yeah. So yeah, I don't think I could put a number on it. I really don't. Um, and also, I mean, I think that there's, I have so much work that no one's ever seen. Um, you know, I have a huge flat file that's just filled with stuff that maybe no one will ever see. Um, but that's, it's really important to have those, I think, because it informs the works that I want people to see. Um, and knowing that, you know, I'm not going to like everything that I make, too. Um, 
and not everyone is also going to like the things that I make as well. Um, yeah, but I don't think I could put a number number on it. Yeah, um, let's see, there are a lot of fiber artists. Um, contemporary artists, uh, Sheila Hicks, um, Sheila Pepe, um, Gada Amir uh, makes really political um, embroidered paintings. Um, yeah, I could, I could send you a list of a bunch. Um, yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll follow. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll send, a, send a list over to you. Anybody else? All right, going, going, gone. Thanks, guys.